Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express News and Views with an Asian and Pacific Islander point of view. Tonight, we are in KPFA's Winter Fun Drive. So guess what I'm going to ask you to do? Give me all your monies. Call us to pledge your support. 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. And tonight we're featuring Enemy Alien. It's a documentary about a Palestinian activist's fight for freedom after 9-11. I interviewed filmmaker Conrad Aderer. He's an independent filmmaker out of New York about his attempt to learn about detention under U.S. government's past and present. We're offering Enemy Alien to you as a thank you gift when you contribute $75. We also have an interview with Patrick Wang, whose film In the Family returns to the Bay Area. And we have the DVD as a giveaway for a $60 pledge. I'm Salima Hamarani. And I'm Maricha. Keep it locked here for Apex Express. So before we start our first segment, I want to ask you to call in and donate. We have a wonderful show and some great giveaways for you. And tonight's show is indicative of the kind of work we produce on a weekly basis. We spend our free time after work, after taking care of our families, to hit the streets and find the kind of culture events that matter to our community. We are a light in the dark. To find the sorts of protests and actions that affect us. And to find the voices that no one else wants to highlight in the API community. That's the kind of work we do. And this year, we were able to bring you so many great pieces. Um, RJ Lozada traveled to the Philippines, and he brought us sound from the People's State of the Nation Address, which was an alternative to the official State of the Nation in the Philippines. We spent a whole hour talking with Asian American and Pacific Islander disability activists, and we've gone out and interviewed our community about mental illness and all of the issues that are affecting people, both in their personal lives and politically. So... It's the kind of coverage you can't hear anywhere else. And if that's something that you support, tonight is a great opportunity to contribute. Give us a call, 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-439-5732. So our first segment tonight is an interview with filmmaker Conrad Aderer. Um, We met up with him when his film Enemy Alien was screening at an event here in Alameda. It was back in October at the Buena Vista United Methodist Church. His film about Palestinian activist and radio producer Farouk Abdul Muti draws connection between the government's response after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the response after 9-11. In a few seconds, you'll hear an interview with Conrad along with clips from the film. And as part of our fund drive, you can get your own DVD of this film when you donate $75. Give us a call, 1-800-439-5732 or donate online at kpfa.org. Hey, my name is Conrad Aderer. I uh, have been a documentary filmmaker for about 10 years, and a lot of my independent work has been about immigrant communities targeted by so-called counterterrorism enforcement and immigration enforcement. I've made a lot of links between the history of Japanese Americans during World War II, including my own family, who are in my documentary, Enemy Alien. The history of the United States is a history of racial discrimination. And nowhere is that clearer than in the nation's immigration policies. The Chinese Exclusion Act was passed in 1882 on the theory that Chinese were undesirable immigrants. As the 20th century dawned, Congress began banning immigration by other Asian groups. Asians remained eternally foreigners, eternal aliens even if they spent their entire adult lives in the United States. A state which will live in infamy. About 1,300 Japanese aliens were arrested on the West Coast within a few weeks after Pearl Harbor. Since Japanese immigrants were forbidden from becoming citizens, any Japanese immigrant was an enemy alien and thus could be treated to summary arrest in case of war. The government wasn't using the Enemy Alien Act after 9-11. They didn't have to. 
In 1996, Congress had passed a set of laws which made hundreds of thousands more immigrants subject to mandatory detention and deportation. The subjects that you cover in your film are very political subjects. How did you come to those politics? You know, after 9-11, I just felt that there was this assumption that everyone was on board with just going after these suspected terrorists, and you know, not too many people have the stamina to really be critical about that and, and hold the government accountable. And So I wanted to do my own work and find out what was happening. And then I was talking on WBAI, and they told me about Farouk Abdelmuti, who uh, was a Palestinian who had the audacity in the immediate wake of 9-11 to help pipe in his contacts back in the refugee camps and the West Bank and have him talk about what was actually going on over there. No one was really talking about over here. This is on the Pacifica station. Yes. He had a show. In right. He was really a producer on there. He was largely behind the scenes. He would set up these phone calls and he would occasionally jump in and translate a little bit or something and say something. He talked with Nayef Hawatme from the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which was the party that Farouk was represented in New York or tried to represent and hand out their paper, Al Huria, and they had a socialist critique and solution of the whole problem. They felt that both Israelis and Palestinians were oppressed by the same system. That was where he was aligned with. My father was a very important voice for the question of Palestine on WBAI and Pacifica Radio and hundreds of thousands of people across the country heard the broadcasts. Basically, my father is accused of having expired immigration documents. But during the time that he was arrested and taken to 26 Federal Plaza in Manhattan, this FBI agent interrogated him severely and beat him. This is supposed to be an INS case. But they treated him like as if he were a criminal or a terrorist. Farouk Abdelmuti was picked up by a joint task force of the New York Police Department, New York State Police, and INS, called the Absconder Task Force. Under the Absconder Initiative, even though there are more than 300,000 people who have deportation orders, they're focusing on about 5,000 people, mainly again from Islamic countries. Priority Absconders were the new enemy aliens. And just to back up a little bit, where were you when 9-11 happened? And what was that experience like for you? Well, I was living in Harlem, and I came down to see the man who was working as a super of my building. And just happened to walk in, I think it was after the second plane had hit. So we were watching one of the towers. And I remember having the thought that, wow, it's really going to be open season on Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians now. New York, the landscape was completely different, so you really could not escape the, the feeling that this had happened. And there were a lot of good things that came through your consciousness at that time, just the way the, the city felt like it was united, not in just a patriotic way, but in the sense that when you're walking around, everyone was kind of connected in a way. It was pretty amazing in such a big city. So that consciousness lasted a while. Then there was a lot of stress because of the economy. It just felt like everything had fallen apart <laughs> for uh, New York City. The fact of 9-11, there's no way it could leave my consciousness. But hearing this drumbeat over and over again and hearing Ashcroft, you actually invoke um, World War II and Pearl Harbor as a parallel requiring a similar response. It really galvanized me into wanting to push back against all these assumptions that we were just sort of being fed. In the introduction, you say that this is on some level about disproving what the government writes and revealing what it hides, that we can write our own histories. How did you come to that as being something that was really important and worth highlighting? You know, at the beginning of the film, I wanted to lay out the overall purpose of the film without revealing too much. The whole process of getting someone out of immigration detention was such a mire of all these really grueling tasks. So to find an overview and distill something was a challenge, but eventually that's what I came up with. Because when I started thinking about my own family history and trying to intertwine it with what was going on, I was able to dig up pictures that my grandfather had taken, which I never knew he had taken pictures. That really blew my mind. But when things were darkest with Farouk, I felt in order to make sense of my own involvement in the story and also really to give myself some kind of spiritual boost, you know, I had to go talk to her. So I drove to Ohio, discovered all these photos he'd taken, and then I discovered 
also that uh, the government, once they had confiscated cameras and other things as potential espionage tools on the West Coast before they incarcerated everybody, they still enforced this no cameras rule inside incarceration, which, you know, if you think about it, really makes no sense except to prevent people from documenting what they were going through and the injustice they were living under. Some pictures have just recently surfaced of the assembly centers where they put people into horse stalls that had just been modified and still smelled like horse flop. So when I started running into trouble with the government, and they kept me from shooting outside 26 Federal Plaza because that was the death star of of all this stuff in New York. It's the headquarters of ICE and Homeland Security and the FBI and everything. Everywhere you went, it seemed that um, you were being prevented from shooting video of trains, all these things. You know, you could argue that there's a reason for it, but also it served a convenient purpose of preventing anyone from scrutinizing the government or revealing the conditions of detention, certainly. That link was really powerful for me when I was able to discover my grandfather's story and the fact he took these pictures that were not supposed to be taken. So that kept me going also. Well, Farouk did not have a camera, he became the eyes and ears from inside the detention center. When I was in the six country, I have about 200 detainees there. You know, the food was terrible and the life was terrible. I see worms, the food inside the food. I begin to collect the names. 78 detainees from 42 nations. And I send a statement outside. I call outside people in the communities to be protesting the street. We were able to bring buses with 150 people out there and hold a rally in front of that jail. We were chanting, we were communicating with the guys inside by megaphone. The guards were out front watching. And they were angry. And they took him and the eight others they saw as leaders. They stuck them in a holding cell downstairs. He's calling us, he doesn't know what's going on. And then we're out of communication with him. The immigration authorities faxed a report to the FBI, saying that Farouk was rallying for Al-Qaeda support. Two officers come to me, he said, I represent the INS. And he said, why you are recruiting people, recruiting Muslims and they're there inside, tell him, you know, what you talk is nonsense. They send them. Meeting Farouk shook me out of the helplessness I'd felt since the attacks of 9-11. Even if a tragic history was repeating itself, it could be changed. Farouk's years of activism had created a community ready to fight on his behalf. He always had a very deep and sophisticated political appreciation of how to connect movements. Connecting the Palestinian struggle to the black struggle, to the women's struggle, to the struggle of lesbians and gays. And he also understood that it was very important to work with progressive people and leftists. And these are the people who have really come out and supported him. Many of the other detention cases were just regular people going about their regular lives. And because they got away with it, then they said, we know we've had Farouk on our files for 30 years. He's been on the radio. He's been getting in our face. We're going to take it. The NYPD cooperated with this stuff, and NYPD task force arrested. You can't just let your friends sit in jail like that. Maybe. All right. Let's talk about the circumstance for a minute. I do believe this is probably the first time that an INS spokesperson has been on a live national broadcast with a detainee in a detention facility. Um, Farouk Abdelmuti on the line with us from Passaic County Jail has been held for more than six months. The stage of our situation is critical. Some people here are sick and they can't even see the doctors. Somebody from Lebanon is named Saleh going to be deported and he'd like to see his daughter. On January 15th, Farouk organized a hunger strike with five other detainees, including the father of his baby girl, who'd never been allowed to hold her since she was born. One week later, Farouk was transferred to York County Prison and placed in solitary confinement. He had 45 minutes a day out of his cell. Uh, that was the only time he had to shower to make phone calls. 
So if you like what you've heard, you can get a copy of that DVD for $75. You know, we really do our part in keeping our ear to the ground for great stories to tell and, the, and closest to the people who are near the action, not the figureheads, but people who lives, whose lives are most affected. Now, you as a listener need to do your part to support the station. Please call us, 1-800-HEY-KPFA. That's 1-800-439-5732. And this DVD is great. I really want you to have this DVD. Um, Conrad went out and he just dug up so much incredible archival footage. Like this is footage that I haven't seen anywhere else um, that I don't think you'll find anywhere else from the time of the Japanese internment, from the time around 9-11, really following Farouk's case from beginning to end and you know, being able to document that story. And so if you're an educator, if you're a parent, this is a wonderful gift to pass on to that next generation. Um, You can get a copy of the DVD by giving us a call today for your contribution of $75. That's 1-800-439-5732. Give us a call, 1-800-439-5732. You know, I'd love to have just two people call before the half hour is up on the show. Just two people. Let's see if we can get two people to call in. So much of this film is about having a voice. And I'm so thankful that Farouk could report to Democracy Now! Before I heard this segment, I had no idea that Muslims were being interrogated and actually beaten in that degree. I mean, I knew Muslims were being targeted and that they were still being followed and surveilled. But I don't think I knew that they were being deported in such vast numbers and they were being basically tortured after 9-11 and roundups. That's the sort of information... You do not hear from other outlets or on other stations. Your mainstream news sources and shows will not tell you that your government is actively hurting immigrants on mere suspicion alone, on the basis of race and religion. But these are the sorts of things you need to know about your own country and your own government if you want to make informed decisions about it. And listen, it's Christmas. So somebody's calling. So I'm Muslim. Christmas is not a big deal to me. But it's winter and it's cold. And if it wasn't for this station, I'd be outside in the cold doing all sorts of other things, but I wouldn't be making radio. So we have one caller. Somebody else calls. You can keep helping me make radio and stay out of the cold. One more person. One more person. Please call us. 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. And that's one of the things that we really love doing here at Apex Express. Um, I think what's great about this show and about a lot of the shows that you hear at this hour, at the 7 o'clock hour, if you tune in regularly, um, you're hearing from people who are part of the community, who are, you know, maybe they're artists, maybe they're organizers, maybe they're educators. Um, and so, and they're reporting on the communities that they're part of and the things that they know about, right? So it's not the same kind of story that you're going to get from a reporter sitting in a newsroom reading a press release, you're getting really a firsthand, much more intimate view of what's going on in our communities. And I think that's just the heart of community radio. So if that's something that you value, if that's something that you want to support, um, give us a call. That's 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. So we just need one more caller to call in to get a copy of this DVD for $75. But really, any contribution helps. Anything helps. The thing about the kind of work that we do is that we're in difficult times right now. And as people in this country, we need to make informed decisions about the kind of government that we have, the kind of society that we want to build. But without information, we can't do that. And if you listen to mainstream news sources, you're not getting the kind of information that will teach you. What we're doing is giving you the kind of information that will help you make decisions about the kind of society that you want to create. Please call us, 1-800-HEY-KPFA, or donate online at www.kpfa.org. We're about to go back to that interview and that film. Um, We... So... We're counting on you. to. We're going to trust that you're going to pick up your phone and you're going to give us a call at 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. And we're back to the... Let's go back to the interview. One of the things that comes up frequently throughout the film is this question of loyalty or disloyalty, right? And as somebody who has lived these past 10 plus years since 9-11... What does that mean for you, this question of loyalty? I recently have come to believe it. And 
I think a lot of other people in the Japanese American community have come to realize is a uh, construction of a government, this whole loyal disloyal thing. It was something that was lodged in the minds of people who lived there too. And the whole questions of what you would do when you're incarcerated, whether you would protest, the idea was everyone was just going to go along and cooperate and be good Americans and show their Americanism by not making waves. That was how they would prove that they didn't deserve to be put there. There was the famous loyalty questionnaire, which the government presented to people who incarcerated. The first question was whether they would serve in the military. These people who were incarcerated by their own government because of their ancestry, people would serve in the military wherever they were sent. So theoretically, they could be sent to Japan to kill people related to them. And then the second one was that you will forswear all loyalty to the Japanese emperor, which is like an absurd, ab insulting question for a lot of these people. But also actually a very dangerous one for people who were not granted citizenship, because at that time, if you were not born in the United States and you were from many uh, Asian countries, you could never become a citizen. So this was just a flat-out racist Cash-22 that people were placed in. A lot of people went along, like my grandparents, and said, yes, yes, because they thought, just get me out of here. But then other people really stood on principle and said, no, or something else. Okay, yeah, I'll serve in the military if you let my family out of incarceration. So everyone who gave any irregular answer was sent to another camp, incarcerated at, at uh, Tule Lake. What unfolded there formed a strong parallel, I saw, to what Farouk went through, because Farouk said no, he resisted, he protested. They beat him at times, they put him in solitary confinement, they transferred all the other people involved with his demonstrations and hunger strikes to other jails, withheld his medication. And they did very similar things to people at Tule Lake. Because many people at Tule Lake, they protested further. They went on labor strikes. Labor was an actual ongoing situation there. And many people were just thrown into this new building, which was created, the jail within the jail, the stockade. And they were put into solitary confinement. So learning all this, which I'd never known or suspected before, it made me realize how these things hadn't been put to rest, as I thought they had. Because the other story is that, okay, the government apologized. It's never going to happen again. They paid reparations. The government apologized, but they went on doing the same thing the next time that there was a crisis. After Pearl Harbor, uh, the federal government went as far as to detain Japanese Americans. Right. And they didn't do that this time, right? Yeah. There is nothing wrong, in my mind, with profiling the way we are seeing this now. With people who would take planes and smack them into buildings, they are not playing by the rules. The immigration laws are very specific. They allow the Attorney General to take what action he needs to. In fact, they're even more far-reaching than the actions that he's taken on occasion. We don't need to know the substance, so long as the government, the law enforcement community, the intelligence community can root them out. But what about the argument that when we look back at what happened to Pearl Harbor and the Japanese Americans, um, you know, everyone agrees that it was wrong. Who agrees? Who agrees? The, the redress. Right. I think, you know, exigent times call for very strenuous reaction. Despite that strenuous reaction, which locked up Farouk Abdul Muti for two years, he was freed on April 12, 2004. He toured around the country to thank his supporters and to raise awareness about the detention centers and the Palestinian struggle. He was kidnapped and taken off to jail. But he's here with us tonight, Farouk Abdul Muti. From the deep of my heart, I thank to all of you. I win in this moment the freedom, but still our struggle continues. I was amazed at the energy Farouk had from the moment he was free. It really did feel like a resurrection. The day after Farouk was released, the 9-11 Commission submitted a report to Congress on the government's post-9-11 response. Out of the 1,200 detainees rounded up in the weeks after 9-11, one person was convicted of a terrorism-related charge. Later in 2004, his conviction was overturned. 140,000 people were targeted for special registration. 
13,000 of them were arrested for immigration violations. The Department of Homeland Security claimed that 11 registrants were connected with the terrorist organization. But the commission found those claims questionable. The Absconder Initiative, which targeted nearly 6,000 Arabs and South Asians for arrest and interrogation, had not caught a single terrorist. But these facts were never mentioned out loud in the hearings. How many men can take on the world with no weapons? He did it with his mind. He did it by telling the truth. There's not a lot of people that can do that. History and the laws of the world denied him a home his whole life. Yet he cared and understood about the struggles of people from all over the world. Even about my own family history. To me, his sacrifice and his victory embodied the struggle of all detainees. So there could be no way to contain him, even in a grave. That was the voice of filmmaker Conrad Ader. His next project is to explore the explore Tule Lake, which is where Japanese Americans, who the government considered troublemakers, were sent during the internment. We're offering that DVD um, that you heard clips from. It's called Enemy Alien, and we're offering it to you tonight as a thank you gift when you make a contribution of $75. So go to your phones, give us a call. The phone number here is 1-800-439-5732. That's one 800 439 5732. You can donate $75 for that D, uh, DVD, but a basic membership is only $25. So please consider sponsoring the airwaves and getting a basic membership. You get a voice in the station. You support programming. With that sort of sponsorship, we maintain integrity. We're not dependent on grants or corporate money that can skew the kinds of stories we collect, the sort of coverage we maintain. Our money is community money. The sort of money that comes from the streets, and without your help, we can't exist. You know, we're in the middle of a difficult economic crisis, and a lot of outlets are shutting down. A lot of organizations are struggling, but we're still here, and we're still working hard, and we need to be here at least to report on the economic crisis. Otherwise, you're not even going to know what's going on from the left. The importance of community media in these times cannot be overstated. We're part of a dying trend. The small local community accountable media outlet that brings you news and entertainment in ways that large conglomerates will not. Please call us, 1-800-439-5732. Can I get at least three more callers on this show? Three more callers. You know, the thing about large conglomerates is that their aims are not our aims. And in rough times, you need outlets like KPFA to bring you news from the streets, from the places larger news stations and radio stations cannot get to or are uninterested in exploring. And look, we don't just drop, drop in and catch sound bites. We stick with stories and with people. We return to subjects. We keep in touch with the people that we interview. That all takes commitment, time, and above all else, it takes a lot of money. Uh, we're not interested in turning communities into sound collages for a nice segment. Right now, in a time of economic crisis, we're interested in forging connections with our Bay Area community so that we can learn from one another and maintain solidarity. Any gift helps. Absolutely anything. It's $25 for a basic membership, but I'm excited to get whatever you have to give me because today's show is all about the money. So are you cooking dinner right now? Put down the spatula. Walk to your phone and call us. 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-439-5732. And again, it's $75 for a copy of Enemy Alien. That's right. Um... $75. $75. You can call, give us a call. You can get a copy of Enemy Alien. The phone number one more time is 1 800 439 5732. That's 1 800 Hey KPFA. You know, I think so many people listen to this station for different reasons. Um, Everybody has something that they appreciate about KPFA and a reason for wanting to support the station. So we wanted to share a clip that we. Got that we've gotten from one of the listeners um, of Apex Express. 
Hi, my name is Katinka Martinez. I'm a professor of Latina Latino Studies at San Francisco State University, and I'm a regular listener and contributor to Apex Express. One of the things that I most appreciate about the program is that the stories always present a you know a big picture and make links across um, groups and struggles. For example, uh, with the discussion of Filipino domestic workers, there will be a discussion discussion of colonialism, of globalization, and a discussion of detainment of Arab and Muslim um, Americans today will make links to Japanese American internment. And those are the kinds of discussions and connections that I like to see in my classroom being made by students. And it's a real resource to be able to point them to Apex programs. And it's so wonderful to hear feedback like this from listeners of Apex Express. I mean, I think every time we get an email or a phone call or even, you know, run into somebody at an event or on the street and hear, hey, you guys are doing a great job or even that was really awful, you know, Um, it's really it's really great because that's what community media is about, being accountable to our communities about, you know, um, getting that type of feedback that doesn't happen at large commercial stations. So if that's something that you want to support, um, give us a call 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. You know, one of the things that no one ever talks about when they talk about community radio stations like KPFA is that one of the great things for me personally is that it helped me become a journalist. A lot of these big outlets do not want to take someone who looks like me under their wing and teach me how to do radio. I'm a brown queer woman. Um, And I never had a chance. When I first wanted to get into radio, I couldn't find anyone to help me. But here I've been learning skills that I wouldn't learn anywhere else. And the way that I've been learning journalism is very unique. I'm not just dropping in. They've actually taught me how to make community with the people that I interview and how to respect them and how to tell stories in ways that you won't hear anywhere else. You know, we talk a lot about what it means to be objective, but we don't talk a lot about what it means to be compassionate towards the stories that you're telling or to the people that you're interviewing. But that's something that I've really learned here. And I think it really makes a difference when you listen to the pieces at KPFA. There is a lot of compassion for people's struggles in this world. And if that's something that you care about a lot, please give us a call. 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-439. Hey, KPFA, I still need three people to call in. We have had people. two. So we need one more. <laughs> <laughs> one so more won't caller. you be that third caller? I mean, really, um, it's an incredible place to support. When the typhoon hit about a month ago in the Philippines, um, or really when there's any big event happening, I have a sense of, okay, I need to tune in to this show or I need to hear what um, what this person has to say about it. And so often I go to KPFA because KPFA is a source that I trust. You know, it's a place that I trust both for um, bringing, bringing on what's relevant uh, for getting the voices of people who are affected out there and for having solid analysis. And so in the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan, we were able to bring you a full hour of coverage um, about, you know, what was happening on the ground in the Philippines, about what was going on in the Philippine in the Filipino American community here in the Bay area. And so if this is the type of coverage that you value um, and you value having a place to tune in and find out um, about these things that you can trust, give us a call. Your support really means a lot. Um, And the phone number here is 1-800-439-5732. For just $25, you can become a member of KPFA and take that first step into getting involved with this radio station. So give us a call, 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. I think one of the best things about this station is that we take... Real pitches from people. I mean, I, I feel like people will come up and ask people at KPFA if they'll cover something, if they'll come to a protest, to drop whatever they're doing, take the recorder and just hit the streets. And that's why you get the kind of coverage you do. But that kind of coverage also takes a lot of money because we need equipment. We need people. 
We need the station. I mean, this all takes a lot of money to run. And we love doing it, but we really want to invite you to help us. And really, we're doing this for you. So um, with that said, if you could call and donate, as I said, any amount helps. Even if it's $5. To whoever just called. Yeah, thank you to whoever just called. So go to your phones. Be that. Be the. Be the next person to give us a call tonight for seventy five dollars. You can get a copy of the DVD Enemy Alien, and for just twenty five dollars, you can become a member of KPFA. Um. So we're gonna go to a second film that we're featuring this evening. This film came out and it really just blew audiences away. It explores what it means to be a family and it's a heartfelt story that's about two dad families, loss, interracial relations, the American South, and the human side of the law. The awards this film has received are too many to name, but they include the critics' pick for the New York Times, Time Out, and Chicago Reader, It was a nominee for the Independent Spirit Award and the Best Narrative Film for the San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival. So we're playing an interview that Robin Takayama did with the writer, director, and star of In the Family, Patrick Wang. Can you just give me your short summary of what the film is about? Sure. So it's about these two dads raising a kid in Tennessee, the six-year-old kid, and the biological father passes away. And in the six years they were together, he never changed his will. And so custody goes to his sister. And the rest of the the film is about uh, this other father trying to find his way back into his kid's life, even though he doesn't have any legal rights to the kid. So, you know, the film covers so many different issues, interracial dating, um, gay parenting, um, you know, racial issues, legal issues. Um, and you played a big role in the film as the writer, director, and lead actor. So um, what is your connection to the story? You know, the there's no literal connection, as in I didn't know people like this. It's not based on, as far as I know, a true story. Um, my connection is I just, I saw this very different family I didn't recognize. You know, I don't, in the place I didn't recognize, and I was just curious. And I wondered about them. I wonder the kinds of things they go through in life. And some of those things are similar to things I've gone through, and other things, no. I've just, you know, sort of had to go through this exercise of sympathies to wonder what is it like to be this combination of things, and and when in life do these things appear, these different things in in ways, you know, race and and sexual orientation and and all these things, you know, in in combinations. Um, Yeah, it was just an exercise in, in, in imagination. Um, but you're from the South, and the film is set in the South. It's set in Tennessee. Um, and, you, you know, you've said that that was a very conscious decision. So can you explain that? Yeah, I, I, I'm from Houston, and so it's a very different part of the South. Um, but I did want to set it in the South because I don't think the South gets a very sophisticated screen treatment often. And I think that a lot of people, you know, who are not from the South have particular notions of the South that are narrow, the same way some people may have views of gay families and gay men that are narrow. And so I wanted there to be something um, to, something for people to open up to, you know, in, in lots of different dimensions and something unfamiliar for everyone to kind of get used to and learn about. Well, you talk about kind of the story unfolding and, and the way that people will be opened up, and you do that well over two hours of unfolding. (laughs) Um, So this is a very long film, although, you know, I I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, So can you talk about the, the, the challenges that you pose to yourself about the length of the film? Yeah, the length kind of snuck up on me. You know, I thought I was making a two hour film and it ends up being almost three hours. And I struggled with it because, you know, you you don't. You know it's going to have a hard time in life. It's going to have a hard time finding audiences, getting people to play it, and a lot of people resist its length. But you, at some point, you know, I, I kept asking myself, is there a solution that is different? And the the conclusion I kept coming with, as much as I tried, is that it would kill all the things that make this film unique, and it would kill the depth of reaction that people have you know this opening up you talk about and and we need that time and it becomes a luxury really 
that time to live with and get to know these other people, this time to think about our own lives and our losses and our loves, um, that I think that's what is stunning about the audience reaction now is that people really appreciate it. They may not have known that's what they wanted, you know, three hours to think about these important things, but they realized that, wow, that was a real luxury. You're a first-time filmmaker, and also, you know, you said that you were in theater before, so why not write a play? Why did you decide to make a film? Theater is wonderful, and I still love theater, but when you, after you've done it, you know, it's gone. It's in your memory. There's some of these peripheral memories of it and evidence of it, but otherwise it's gone. And I was at a point in my life thinking about my mark in the world, something of permanence to give to the world, and so that's what film ends up being. And, and then also, you know, it's your first time making a film, so how did you prepare, um, both with the writing and the directing? Because there's a lot of wisdom to sort of how you block the shots, and then also how the story unveils itself. You know, I, I love to prepare. You know, once we have a location, I take all my photos, I have all my measurements, and I understand where things, what things look like in that room. And then I just move my perspective around that room and I think about where is it interesting to watch where do people live and so a lot of that is in the preparation you do beforehand so you know you can make your charts and your sketches and, and your shot lists and everything and then the other piece is you're so confident in that by the time you get to shooting that you relax and you watch and what happens is these new opportunities emerge you know that um, if you're too worried or if you're too insecure in what the scene is about, you don't get to notice. And so that was a lot of the fun of this. And I, I don't know. I, I think it takes sometimes a first-time filmmaker to just be dazzled by it all. That you find some of these opportunities, and you don't feel, I, I you know, as an outsider, I don't feel particularly married to rules and convention. That you know, if I just see an opportunity, something that. Wow, what if we see it from here or, you know... Um, Can you give an example of, one of, of an instance like that? There was, there was this one morning I was driving to set and I was in this kind of early morning haze. And I was thinking through the shot and it's a shot where Joey and Chip are coming back from the funeral. And I don't know if it was because of that haze that it looked kind of blurry to me. The scene looked blurry. And so I said to the DP, you know, why don't, what, if, what if it's blurry? You know, when the, if out of focus as they're coming home. And so, he's, you know, he turned a couple knobs on the camera and he's like this. And he, he made it a little out of focus. I'm like, no, really blurry. And I, and I realized that it also helps us transition out of we're in blackout for a long time. It's almost nice to start with something conceptual. And then it almost feels like tears that we're seeing the scene through. Um, so all these things that I, that morning I hadn't known. But piece by piece, it kind of is like, oh, and then the ideas build on each other. And then suddenly you have this sequence that's one of my favorites in the film. Yeah, I remember that scene now that you describe it. It was, it was really beautiful. Um, so as, as much as folks are loving your film now, you experienced a lot of rejection. It was, was it like 30 film festivals that rejected your film? Um, but now there's this deal with New Yorker films. And I, I looked into them a little bit, but why don't you talk about what that opportunity is? Sure, I'll, I'll talk about it in, look, in contrast to some of the other things we're doing um, so that you can kind of see what their role is. Uh, there's the commercial theatrical market, which is a lot of what people understand as even the art houses and then the chains in their cities. Um, we're going to play in those cities, and that's taken a lot of great work by a lot of people to get us into those theaters and playing those cities. So I'm very happy about that. But, you know, there's also a lot of other places where people want to see film. And there are places like film societies in small towns, uh, nonprofits, museums, schools. And New Yorker has kind of really developed this market that is ignored by a lot of the larger uh, distributors because they kind of look at the big volume things you can do. And this is a very one off, unique, person by person, organization by organization kind of market. And so we're very lucky to have this company that not only has great. Um, expertise in this market and, and real trust from the people who participate in this market, but real good taste in filmmakers. You know, they've introduced um, American audiences to Godard, they have the Ozu catalog, they, they have wonderful, wonderful filmmakers. On our show, a lot of the um, ways that issues are addressed is much more 
confrontational in your face through, you know, some of our hip hop musicians that we have on, some of the activists that we have on. And your film raises a lot of these issues without putting um, a message in front of people's faces. Um, and I just wondered about what your goal was in making this film. I think the first thing I'll say is I think it's wonderful that there are in-your-face messages, too. And all, it, it takes all types of things for change and to start conversation in the world. And I'll answer your other question by, um, by actually saying something that an audience member, a way an audience member put it. And they said, some, some films make you think. This film lets you think. And I think it puts certain things in front of you, and it lets you see the issues that you observe and that you notice and it lets you think about what's going on and how did we get there and what's at play and I think that that's another way to engage people in these ideas so that was Patrick Wang writer, director and star in the indie film In the Family uh, Marie interviewed him back in March during the Bay Area premiere Robin. at the San Francisco International Asian Film Festival so we have a DVD copy of this movie as well it's also yours for $60 if you pick up the phone right now and call us, 1-800-439-5732. His movie, as you said, lets you think. And we hope that you feel that KPFA lets you think, that we bring you an alternative perspective to the mainstream news coverage. You know, I think that's really something that we don't think about very often when we hear other types of news, but instead of telling you things, we sort of really get to the subtle underneath of everything, of a story, and like show you what's there and let you think about it. Um, and you're not going to hear that anywhere else. I often think about the thing with big news stations is that you never really know where the money's coming from and you never really know how that affects the types of stories that they're able to tell or how it affects what they're even willing to go out and see. Um, I would love to know where all these big stations get their money from. And if you think about it, the community radio station is actually kind of a radical idea. It's a bunch of people getting together and actually like paying for a radio station that's theirs. They basically hire us to research for you, to tell you what nobody else is telling you. That's a really radical thing. It's a really radical thing. And if that's something that you support, you should definitely call in. We've had a, a lot of calls, but I would like to have maybe two more before this is over. We've got about 10 minutes left. Two more calls. Please call us, one 800 Four three nine five seven three two one eight hundred. Hey KPFA. And there are so many times where Apex Express or and listening to KPFA um, throughout the day has made me think and has raised questions for me that maybe I wouldn't have asked otherwise. Um, you know, I feel like I'm always learning new things when I tune in. And so, if you are somebody who has learned something new in these last three months from listening to KPFA, uh, please go to your phones and give us a call. That's 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. You know, one of the things about listening to other types of news stations, when I'm on my driving in my car and on my way home and I want to listen to some news, it really makes me kind of depressed. It makes me depressed not because of what I'm hearing, but because of the way that the journalists talk about the communities that they're supposed to be reporting on and the way in which they view the world. One of the great things about KPFA, one of the things that I love about alternative media in general is that it kind of gives me some hope. It gives me hope that people care enough about their communities to research what's going on, to connect with people, to give them a sense of respect. You don't hear that anywhere else. You really do not hear that anywhere else. If that is something that you support, please donate. Any little bit helps. You can also donate online at kpfa.org, but we do need two more callers. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. That's... The number one more time is 1-800-439-5732. And, you know, I want to ask you, we've been talking so much tonight about the role that KPFA has played in our lives, in the things that we've learned, in what we value and appreciate about the station. And so I want to ask you to think about the role that KPFA plays in your life. You know, um, are these voices that you're hearing on the radio is that what's keeping you company on your way to work every morning or on your way home? Is, you know, is this 
what you have on in the background when you're making dinner or running errands or, you know, trying to get your baby to stop crying. Um, you know, I know for me, one of the one of the roles that KPFA plays in my life is that we leave the the radio on for the dogs when they when we go out and when we come home. I always joke with my partner that um, you know our dog, his name is Mansi. That Mansi says, "Oh, I feel much smarter now because I've been listening to the radio all day." Um, and so, you know, I think there's so many different <laughs> ways that radio can play into can can play into our lives and really enrich our lives um, and. And so if you appreciate that, you know, just take a couple of minutes out of your evening tonight, go to your phone and give us a call. 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-439-5732. And our thank you gifts this evening are a DVD of Enemy Alien, which you heard at the top of the hour by filmmaker Conrad Ader. Um, that's drawing connections between the Japanese internment and the uh, the ways in which the U.S. government has detained and gone after Muslims in the wake of 9-11. You can have that DVD for a pledge of $75. We're also offering Patrick Wang's In the Family. You just heard Robin Takayama's interview with that filmmaker for a pledge of $60 um, or both DVDs at a discounted rate of $125. So please go to your phones. The phone number here is 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-439-5732. And I really can't drive home enough the idea that this is like a radical thing to do, to to like use your money to buy a radio station as a community. I mean... We're not getting our money from petroleum companies. We're not getting them from banks. This is that's kind of amazing. I mean, it's a community project. I and if you really, really think about it, that's a really, really radical idea that a group of people can buy their own news and trust the people who are the journalists to bring them stories that are equal and fair. Um, and I think one of the great things that has happened because of the community buy-in is, you know, I work at other outlets and it's really hard for community members to come up to us and say, hey, can you report on this? And we say, no, we can't because we don't have the money for it or that's not what we're doing. But at Apex, I think one of my favorite things about this station is that people just ask us to report on things. They'll send us emails or we'll ask you to give us stories and we take them basically all the time. We love having your input. That is not something that you'll see anywhere else but KPFA, especially especially at Apex. It's one of the things that I really love about this particular show. And if that is good to you also, I would love for you to donate. We're almost done. We just need a couple more callers. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. We're coming into our, the last five minutes here. Um, and just thank you so much for being with us this evening and for spending so many of your Thursday evenings with us here at Apex Express on KPFA. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the other part that we haven't talked about is just the ways in which radio can make you feel connected to people. Um, that the voice is just this, the human voice is just this really intimate intimate thing and so whether it's you know if you're driving somewhere or if you're alone in a house or you know wherever it is that you are that we don't have to feel so alone because we're we're listening to the radio and we're hearing about other people's lives and we're hearing from other people who you know are in our communities or outside of our communities maybe um and that that is that that type of connection is becoming more and more rare in the world that we live in and so if that's something that you want to preserve if that's something that you feel is important um give us a call our phone number here is 1-800-439 Five seven three two. That's one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. You know, I love that you said that about the intimacy of the voice because I think that's really, really true. I think actually, as humans, one of our maybe innate things is that we need to hear stories from each other, and a lot of our traditions are storytelling traditions where we just sit down and listen to each other talk about epics or myths or each other's lives. Um, and I think in this kind of current day where everything is really like 
on the internet and really flashy, um, radio kind of gives us a chance to relax and actually think. And it gets, it gives us a chance to connect with each other and practice a type of like interested patience, which is not something that you practice very often. Um, and I love the fact that KPFA is here to help us do that. Please call us 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-KKPFA. We're almost done with today. And it's... You know, it's just such a diff. It's such a different energy. I think you're right, Salima. It's such a different energy that you get when you're listening to the radio versus something like watching the television or, you know, on the internet. Um, I I was recently in Los Angeles for the holidays and spent a lot of time watching TV because we don't have one up here. And so it's like this thing where we go out of town for a couple of days and we have access to TV and we just watch lots of TV. Um, and the way that that affected my energy, you know, after a couple, even just a couple of days was so different than the energy that I get, you know, at home listening to the radio and being able to sort of do other things. Um, and feeling just a lot more relaxed and a, le- a lot less kind of zombie-like. Yeah, it makes you feel smarter too. <laughs> <laughs> so we are coming into our community calendar. Before we do that, I do want to thank the people who have donated to us today um, and today's food donors. Marie, do you want to do the donations? Sure. So we want to thank uh, Carrie Mark. She out of San Francisco, and Evelyn Fujimoto out of El Cerrito. They are among the people who gave us a call tonight, and we're just so, uh, we're really thankful for your contributions. And um, also today's food donors, Semi Freddy's, Budupi, and Be Healthy Honey. They're feeding our really successful volunteers back in the room behind us. So with that, we're going to go to the community calendar. On Friday, December 13th, join us at Cafe Gabriela for the first of three fundraisers for the Philippines we'll be attending this weekend. It's an art auction, poetry reading, and community gathering. All proceeds go directly to the Philippines in helping to rebuild after the devastating typhoon. That's from 6 to 9 p.m. at Cafe Gabriela in downtown Oakland. Also this Friday at 7 p.m., you can meet us at Make It Fresh. It's a creative storytelling for the urban environment event um, put on by Movement Generation and that organization actually went out and gathered stories in our neighborhoods um, about this crazy beautiful environment that we call home so it includes poems and songs memories and manifestos and that's at Soul Space in downtown Oakland this Friday at 7pm On Saturday, December 15th, we're excited to check out Asata Will Rise, a free community event that honors the contributions of Bay Area women of color engaged in visionary organizing and community healing work. The AWR Resistance Panel and Performing Arts Tribute takes place on December 15th at Eastside Arts Alliance, a community cultural center in Oakland. We're also attending Turn It Up for the Philippines. It's a dance party at the Den. Lots of amazing amazing DJs, prizes, and surprise performances. All proceeds will go directly to relief efforts. 21 and over only. That's from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. on Saturday, December 14th, also in downtown Oakland. And our last Typhoon fundraiser is on Monday, December 16th. Balik Bayan with Love from Oakland, a night of dance, music, and community for Typhoon Haiyan survivors, 6 p.m. at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center. On Wednesday, December 18th, that's next Wednesday at 12 p.m., join Eviction Free San Francisco and their allies in the fight for housing justice in San Francisco as they take on a landlord, which will be named at the action in San Francisco's Mission District. The action is happening at 3248 22nd Street at Bartlett. For more information on these events and to hear an archive of the show, visit apexexpress.org. If you have ideas for future shows or you want to get involved with our collective, shoot us an email, apex at kpfa.org. That brings us to the end of tonight's show. Our intro and outro music is by Asian Crisis. Thanks to our board op, Jill Montgomery. Tune in next week for another round of Apex Express.